and has been running in Asia Pacific and in Europe quite successfully and we are going to be bringing that to North America later on this year. So without further ado, um, I will give the stage over to Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Um, it might uh, be interesting for uh, you to know that before I was a consultant or a trainer or a coach, whatever is the label that you would like to put on me, I did have a real job. Um, I did work for the company that June also worked for, uh, Reckitt Benkiser. Before that, uh, it was Reckitt and Coleman. That's when I joined. And before that, I was with 3M Healthcare, uh, selling into doctors and pharmacy. So I, um, I had a number of different experiences within, uh, within that uh, career. I was a detailer and a pharmacy rep. So I was detailing doctors and then going and visiting pharmacies in the afternoon. I was then uh, in marketing. I had a brief sojourn in regulatory affairs and licensing, which was a complete disaster. That lasted about a year, and I had to move quickly back into marketing. I started a startup business for Reckitts in Spain with the pharmacy division in Spain. I then went on to run a supply chain for them in Italy. Again, a very dangerous move to give marketers a supply chain re uh, responsibility, but it worked. Um, I then came to Asia as general manager, uh, was there for a number of years, went on to Singapore as regional marketing director, and then finished at Reckitt Benkiser with uh, responsibility for Eastern Europe. Now, with all of that career, and it was a great career, I loved it, it was a great organization, I kept learning and learning and learning. There was actually two things that were real ahas to me at the end. Two things which are the m two most important facts of any business. The first fact was that the most important asset that we own in any business, the most important property that we have, is not our factories or our buildings or our offices or our computers or our cars. It's, of course, our brands. Our brands are the proprietary and unique assets that we have that every single day we have to keep taking care of those. Because if we take care of our brands, what will happen is that we will have a very uh, secure future. We will get more consumers engaging with us or customers who will be, be, ab be able to pay, pay more for us and support us. Um, and building brands is not just the responsibility of the marketing department. Uh, thank you, June, for putting that as one of the key points. It is an organizational responsibility. I found that out when I was the supply chain director. I could affect the equity behind the brand with what I did in supply chain, uh, what happens in logistic, what happens in R&D. It's an organizational responsibility. The second most important fact was that the most important resource that we have in building brands was not our marketing budget. It wasn't our sales budget. It wasn't our conditions that we offered the trade. The most important resource is actually our people. No surprise there. Because if we have a team of people who are integrated, working together with common objectives, with a common purpose, with the right skills, the right knowledge, the right behaviors, both inside the organization and our teams and partners outside of the walls of our organization, wow, we can create magic. And that is something which unfortunately we talk about people being our most important asset, and usually we leave it at that. I wanted to change the way that organizations thought about investing in people. And for the last 14 years, I've dedicated myself to having the same importance in organizations for people development as they have for the investment in terms of marketing and advertising. Because for me, that is really what builds brands. So why am I standing here talking about consumer healthcare? Yes, I cut my teeth on consumer healthcare. I was responsible for Gaviscon and the development of Gaviscon in the early days. Uh, but the story of this uh, institute, this academy, we call it in other parts of the world, started about three years ago when Nicholas and I were sharing a stage at the Australian Self-Medication Industry Conference. And I had been asked to present on the future of pharmacy 
And three years ago, we could see many of the trends that we talk about today, uh, some in, in their infancy, some absolutely driving. And I presented a future which was strong for consumer healthcare. I talked about major change, major shift. And Nicholas, quite rightly, as you saw today, presented the actual numbers of our industry. 4.3, 4.4, we had a, a good year with 5%, now coming back to 4%. And it didn't feel right. We said, what's wrong? Because as an industry, we know that we have to grow. We know that the future could be very, very bright. But maybe we don't know how to grow. And that was the beginning of this concept, which was how can we start to drive growth in this industry through our people, through building skills, knowledge, and, 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 and behaviors, through reinventing, if you like, training and development. And so that's why we started this particular initiative uh, two years ago. We launched it in uh, 2016. We're now just coming up to our second year. Um, so we decided that we would try to focus in terms of what were the key drivers that we needed to focus on as an industry globally. All right? So we believe very much. Our purpose is to uh, really drive the potential of this industry. We really believe in the potential of this industry. We believe in the potential of the individuals, you and all the teams that you represent, uh, to really grow brands. So everything we do is designed to grow the potential of these individuals in order that you can create stronger brands, in order that you can create a stronger industry. Because literally, we are on a tipping point. As Nicholas mentioned, as many of you have spoken about, we have a lot of technology companies who are owning the relationship between them and the consumers. And if they are successful in doing that, then we could be relegated to becoming a supplier to some of these huge giants. Just as the generics companies are taking over many of our market shares in, in, some, of the, uh, in some of the categories that we're involved in, this could happen, but in an even more dramatic way if we do not act. So consequently, we have to change. And our uh, position is we can change faster if our people are developed and can grow and create a better and stronger industry. So in terms of our mission, how do we deliver this? It's to really work on insights. Well, no secret there. But the problem is that in many cases, we play the word insight, but we don't really believe or act in it. So building from consumer insights, but insights around our customers, insights around competitors, insights around uh, the channels that we, we work with. Um, training also needs to be practical. So many of you will do training in your organizations. But in many cases, it's very theoretical. We had a big uh, push on e-learning recently. And many organizations spent many millions of dollars creating e-learning platforms where individuals would go on and learn. The problem is that's great in making individuals uh, more intelligent theoretically but it's very different from knowing something and then understanding it and applying it. So everything we wanted to do would be around how can we turn this into a, an, an ROI? How can we actually get a return on investment from the time and the resources that we spend developing people through these programs? And finally, great that you can make someone more intelligent, make, great that you can give them the skills, but what's actually important is to inspire them, is to actually help them to believe in themselves and to believe that they can do it. So therefore, we wanted to bring training into another dimension, to bring inspiration, motivation into these uh, events so that people walk out of there really believing that they're going to make a change. And guess what? They do. So um, we, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, Nicholas and I sort of started the uh, organization in 2016. Um, 
it was a great partnership. It is a great partnership because it brings together the, the data, the insights of 40 years of experience in the uh, consumer healthcare arena, together with a proven model in terms of how we can deliver ROI through people, through training interventions. Um, we're in North America, it's great to be here, and here, of course, what we wanted to do is bring together a local uh, knowledge and experience. So we're very proud to have Ed also as part of the team, and uh, this will bring uh, an element of really deep local understanding because we absolutely appreciate that every market is different. Every market needs its own style and approach, and therefore uh, very proud to start this. Um, track record so far, as I said, two years old. Uh, in the last year, we worked in 36 different countries. We have uh, had sessions, of course, across four continents. We have had uh, individuals from 50 different organizations, and we have had uh, participants and individuals in workshops and trainings of over 1,000 individuals, uh, making major differences to their organizations. So it's been something that we're very proud and very privileged that the industry has adopted uh, and allowed us to influence the two most important elements of their business, their brands and their people. And this has made a major change. Okay, um, people. The people that we have involved in terms of trainers, coaches, are people who've been there and done it. What we wanted to do is move away from academics and go to people who have actually been and run businesses and have grown brands, have the battle scars, and are able to talk about the stories that they have. So these trainers, if you like, are really uh, passionate experts who have that experience, but the passion to be able to transmit that to the team and to help people to believe and understand. And of course, we will do a similar thing in the US, and Ed will talk to you a little bit about what are our plans to be able to experience this. Okay. Um, I wanted to do this in a little bit of a different way. Rather than sort of sit and preach or stand and preach at you, uh, I wanted to actually have the feeling or be able to transmit the feeling of what some of the elements of this intervention, this event might be. So what I would, would appreciate is some uh, uh, audience interaction at times. I will uh, try to sort of demonstrate some of the tools that we use because I wanted you not just to sort of, again, get the theory, but be able to experience some of the things and take away some of the tools that you could even use uh, tomorrow or the next day. So, ways of working. When we do these kind of uh, training interventions, we try to build in a way of working, a, uh, a way of interacting within the workshop which really helps people to learn uh, and to understand. So, uh, very much open and positive, supportive and building. We always, we never have workshops in this kind of arena of theater style. It's always within groups because we learn better when we work in a smaller group. We also learn better when we have something tangible, a real piece of business to learn on. So whenever there is a training intervention, it is actually working on a real piece of business. If it's done for a specific organization, it tends to be a challenge that the organization is facing. And what we do is we'll turn that into the business case and the team will work on that. Sometimes we have open workshops where we will invent a case, but based on Nicholas and the team's data, it will be built around real business. So hence, so important that the team is actually building on something which is really real. Of course, technology, love it and we're all addicted to it. So we encourage, as Nicholas said this morning, to turn off our phones and basically focus, because actually the most powerful uh, piece of technology we have is between our ears. So far, technology, even with AI, even with machine learning, has not even come close to the computing power of the human brain. It's just when we give it attention, then we can create magic. And also, Workshops and these interventions need to have an element of emotion. And therefore, when people talk about, oh, it's important to have fun in a workshop, 
there's actually a serious side to it. It's that when we are having fun, we tend to be much more emotional. And when we're emotional, we tend to absorb much more information, we are much more creative, and we come up with even better ideas. Now, there's a couple of tools, and here's one of the tools which I would gift you. We call it a listening sheet. And we use this as a way for people to capture ideas as they go through these workshops, because we use a lot of information, we bring data from the outside, we bring insights, but in a way, we have to help people to focus. Because the fact is that when we listen, you filter. You filter out things, whether you liked it or not. Subconsciously, you'll filter out things. You'll always be assessing things. You'll think, oh, that doesn't fit, or that fits. That's interesting. That's not interesting. And this is a little piece of physiology, which I leave you with. Um, the human brain basically has 2 billion electrical stimulus every single day. 2 billion electrical stimulus hits our human brains every single day. And if we tried to consciously think about all of these stimulus, we would literally, our brains would explode. It would just get so hot. So we have a filter. It's called the reticular activating system. And what this filter does is it filters out 99.9% .9 of all of the electrical stimulus and basically focuses on only around 16,000 messages. I give you an example. Do you feel your heart beating at the moment? No, no, but you're doing a great job. You're still standing or uh, sitting and looking at me and smiling. Thank you very much. But do you remember a time when maybe there was an accident or the kids nearly had an accident or you had a shock? Maybe you were watching a movie or there was something that really shocked you. Do you remember your heart beating at that particular moment, right? That's the filter. It switches on and it switches off depending on the moment. I don't know if you ever had the feeling when you bought a new car and you're driving along the road with your new car and all of a sudden you start to see the same car again and again and again. That's the filter. It starts to get you to focus on what's important. And this is a really important marketing learning as well because as June was saying, when you've spent lots and lots of money on your advertising and you're out there and you're so proud of your ad, and you go and you talk to your customers and your consumers and you say, hey, what did you think of the ad? And they go, what ad? It's because we didn't open the filter. We didn't connect. So one of the important messages here is that when you are developing communication, if you don't have a hook that really opens that filter at the beginning of whatever that piece of communication is, whether it's a visual or whether it's a piece of uh, copy or whether it's a TV ad or something that comes up on the internet, on social networking, if that first two or three seconds does not capture and open that filter, the rest of the ad becomes wallpaper. So hence, what we do is we get the teams to practice this in the workshops. Uh, so, first of all, we ask them, what's exciting about what you hear? Because many times in business, we look for what's wrong. We tend to evaluate. What's a concern? Many times in, in uh, these workshops, people don't put concerns on the table. They leave it to themselves, and yet concerns are very powerful. If something feels wrong, then something needs to be done about it. Of course, there's things to know more about, and we try to keep the ideas coming through. Because all of these interventions are built on this principle which I call Cuba. Know, understand, believe, and act. Training many times helps you to know about something, makes you a bit more intelligent about knowing a particular topic. But to know something and to understand it are two completely different things. So we operate on a principle of 20-80. 20% theory, 80% application, discussion, uh, working on the case study, presenting back, because that's when you really start to understand it, to understand it and what it means to you in your particular position. And of course, if you are able to understand it, then you might believe in it. And if you believe in it, then you will act. Remember the last time that a senior manager or one of your peers 
told you that you had to do something that you didn't really believe in? How much effort, how much passion, how much motivation did you put behind it? You'd hit a brick wall or you'd hit a barrier and you'd come back to your boss and say, hey, it doesn't work. Whereas think about the time when you did believe in something. You were absolutely convinced. Think about how much passion and effort you put behind it. And when you hit a barrier, you found a way around it. Over the top, around it, you found a different argument. So consequently, that's where we need to be getting to in terms of making change, helping to be people to believe in it. Right, so there is content. There is different uh, areas of content. So before we started the academy, we actually went to you. We went to the industry and we said, what are the topics? What are the strategic drivers for you to drive growth in your companies, in your industry? And we tried to understand what were the strategic drivers. And the second question was, what are the gaps within the organizations in terms of these drivers? What are the competencies then that are missing? And so we tried to develop the, um, the programs built around what is going to really drive the industry rather than the theory behind it. So we, uh, we work on uh, one area of, of the programs called Winning in the Pharmacy, which is something we've talked about a lot, which is how do we create the right environment, whether it's bricks and mortar or virtual, so that our brands can grow within the pharmacy environment. Secondly, uh, the people side, uh, about uh, how do we develop our people. And leadership is one of these most important responsibilities that we have as an organization. I heard a very, very uh, disturbing uh, fact uh, from a piece of market research by Mintel that looked at 300 top companies and looked at the levels of engagement in the employees of these 300 top companies. And don't quote me exactly, but effectively it was. 20% of individuals within these organizations were engaged with the organization. They followed the strategy, they believed in it, and they were real assets to the business. 60% didn't give a damn. They came to work, they did their job, they went home. They were not, they were very neutral to the organization. And frighteningly, 20% were actively disengaged. So here we have a group of people actually working against the strategy of the company. And when I believe that people are the most important resource when it comes to building your company, building your brands, wow, that was disturbing. And what is that down to? Of course, it's down to leadership. It's not because they were bad people because when you employed them, you employed them as great people. But somewhere along the journey, something disconnected. So hence, leadership is a very important part. Um, we talked about product, and June again talked something very important, which is the core of your portfolio. We all get seduced by the innovations, and we get very excited, and we uh, move from one innovation, one launch, to the next one. But we forget that the core is what basically funds the company, funds the brand, funds the business. And here, bringing innovation, one of my particular passions is how do we bring innovation through existing products? How do we talk about new claims, new benefits, new ways of working? How do we bring these products into complementary solutions? We talked about diabetes. Katia talked about diabetes this morning. And all of the ways that we can actually work with patients who have diabetes with consumer healthcare products and OTC products to actually improve the patient outcome. It's not often that we've done that in the past. And that's something we have to do in the future. Of course, about brands, how do we build stronger brands? Um, customers, as we will see, um, the pharmacist or the pharmacy assistant or the advisor in the stores, whether they're online or in the stores, is the most important influencer of the purchase in the store. In my experience, and I have to say sorry to the, my colleagues in GSK, but at Reckitt, we were attacked by GSK, uh, who uh, did a switch with their H2 antagonist, uh, and they directly attacked us in Gaviscon. And at that time, we were Reckitt and Coleman. We didn't have the strength of Reckitt Benkiza has today. 
And we literally were quaking in our boots. We didn't know what to do because GSK was three, four, five times our size. So what did we do? We decided we would focus on training, training the pharmacy assistants in the UK. We changed everything, we moved our budgets, we focused on training these uh, men and women in the pharmacies for three years, constantly, constantly talking about reflux, what it does, how it works, what are the different options, why Gaviscon is a great solution. After three years, GSK gave up. Right? Of course, they're still there, but Gaviscon retained its number one position in the pharmacy. Interestingly, it then became number one in grocery, and it was still number one in prescriptions. So the power of training our customers, not just in our product, but in the category, is so strong. Don't just go in there and tell them how good your product is. Go and tell them how they can give a better recommendation uh, so that they can improve a patient outcome or a customer outcome across the whole of the category. And then finally, this element of market insights. How can we take a lot of data that we have in this market, in this industry, and turn it into powerful insights? Okay, I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit about the way that the consumer uh, winning in consumer healthcare program runs. And again, a little bit of tips and techniques. Um, a little model that I would give to you whenever you approach these kind of uh, um, initiatives, always build it on a foundation of insights. And I don't mean just consumer insights, because that's not enough. You have to build it with customer insight, with competitive insight, with category insight. See the category from the point of view of the, of the consumers, not just the industry definition of the category. You have to then marry those insights together in order to come up with better opportunities. And I would always challenge you that the opportunities should always be win, win, win. Win for the consumer or the shopper, win for the customer, and win for our brands. Because if you miss one of those areas of benefit, your whole initiative will fail. So hence, always look for win-win-win opportunities. Then, planning activities. With all of the plethora of different communication channels that we have, initiatives that we're able to, uh, to engage, it's now becoming imperative that our marketing teams are able to create this, what I call, communication alchemy to be able to choose the different channels and create, if you like, a synergistic campaign that builds on each other, that creates awareness, but then, of course, activates the, uh, the brand at the point of sale. And then finally, to implement with excellence. Right, building understanding and insights. Uh, of course, it all starts with creating a great challenge. So setting a challenge is very important for the teams. Uh, if you aren't clear right at the beginning of your initiative, then how do you know when you're able to succeed and how do you know that you will actually uh, be able to uh, get what you want? So actually having a very clear challenge. And I like to take the, uh, the P&G principle of creating a stretch objective, right? Something where you really feel uncomfortable, not panic yet, but uncomfortable. And if you're able to do that, that has an interesting effect on the brain. It causes you to start thinking of different ways to get there. If you start to say, right, I'm just going to grow 1% over the next 10 years, well, just do what you do. Just do it better, faster, bigger, whatever. But if you say, I want to create a 50% growth in the next two years, wow. Then you start to think of different uh, ways of approaching it. Insight. For me, an insight is defined as a deep, profound understanding of a consumer or a customer's uh, beliefs, what they believe in in terms of their values, attitudes, the way that they think, and behaviors that lead us to a commercial uh, opportunity for our brand. And one of the challenges I would give you is that sometimes we become lazy and we grab insights at the level of behaviors, what people say or what people do. That's great, and it's proven. I can see it, or I can hear it. But actually, that's not competitive, because your, comp your competitors will effectively have access to the same insight. So 
there's a number of tools, and there's a, a tool called the YYY tool, the 5Y tool, which uh, I'm sure many of you know. You ladder down the insight uh, until you're able to achieve something which is at the uh, belief or attitudinal level. So, give you a little bit of an example. Um, I had, uh, in, I work in skincare as well, um, and in, uh, in uh, mastiche uh, skincare, if you like. And one colleague said to me, uh, uh, someone working in trade marketing, came to me and said, Steve, Steve, listen to what you said. We have a great insight. And I said to him, okay, what's your insight? And he said, our customers, our shoppers, like to smell the product before they buy it. They like to smell the cream in the store before they buy it. I said, okay. He said, no, no, and it's proven. We tested it. Consumers say that's what they do. Fantastic, I said. So uh, what are you going to do with it? He said, okay, we're going to have testers. I said, okay. And what about the competition? Unilever, the, do they have testers? Oh, yeah, they have testers. All right, but what else? Oh, we will have really great fragrances. Okay, and P&G and Beiersdorf, they will have nasty fragrances. It's not competitive. But if we think about it, why is it that we smell something that we put on our bodies? Why do you do it? What's, what's the first reason why you might smell it? If you are wanting to buy a cream or a shampoo, why do you smell it at the store before you buy it? Sorry, it, it does it because it needs to smell nice. Very important. Why is it important that it should smell nice? I want to smell nice. I'm going to put it on my body. I'm going to put it in my hair. I want to smell nice. Why is it important for you that you smell nice? Ah, I don't want other people. I want to be accepted by other people. Right, all right. We have a society where it's important to smell nice, to be accepted. Why is it important to be accepted by other people? Because? Human nature. Human nature. I want to be loved. I want to be accepted. And how do you feel when you know that you smell good and you are able to interact well with people? Confidence. All right. Now, of course, that's quite logical, but actually there is brands out there that have taken that and turned it into the purpose of the brand. So this is a brand called Axe or Lynx, of course, from Unilever, that it's a deodorant brand, and all it sells is confidence. And confidence for who? Confidence for young boys, men in their puberty, up to about 19, 20 years old, who need the confidence to get the girl. When all the hormones are raging, they really have no idea to do, they have no confidence in terms of how to approach the ladies or the girls, and therefore, what does Axe or Lynx give them? It gives them that confidence. The funny thing is, uh, girls actually don't like the smell of Lynx or Axe, but if anyone's got teenage boys at home, yeah? you'll know you have this cloud of stuff, sweet fragrance going out of the door. But it gives them such confidence that the girls, OK, they don't, they give up at some point in time. Right. Um, you might say, well, that's great. That's uh, deodorant. That's consumer health. That's not consumer health care. That's personal care. How can we actually get that in the market that we work in. And I want to give you an example of Neurofen for Children. It's a, a, a brand I worked on some 12, 13 years ago. And here we were challenged because Neurofen for Children in the UK had a number three position and it was only with about 5% market share. Number two uh, was either GSK or j and I forget exactly who, which had 6%. But number one was a brand called Cowpole, which had about a 60% market share. 60% market share. It was immovable. Whatever you did, Cowpole's share went up. So what did we do? We decided, first of all, we wanted to be a strong number two. And we decided, actually, that strength had to be around 30% market share. So we went through the process which I'm describing. We looked at who was the consumer that they were targeting or who was the shopper that they were targeting. And of course, everybody was targeting the new mother. And that might make sense. Here is a woman 
She's pregnant, she's about to have a baby, she doesn't use any children's medicines today, therefore, fantastic, we can convince her to switch to our brand. But there's a problem there. So, mothers in the room, when you remember that first few days and months when you had your little baby for the first time in your arms, were you scouring the TV for great ads for products that you could use for your baby? No. Who you were listening to? Your mother? Pediatrician, doctors? You were listening to everybody but companies. And therefore, guess what? The number one brand became stronger and stronger. So number one, stop advertising to new mothers. But then we found out, actually, that there is a time in the life of the baby, around nine months old, when mothers now feel confident to take their own decisions. And so they start to listen to other people. So nine months is a critical age in the day in the life of that particular mother. Then something else happens at nine months. Nine months is also when babies get teeth. And we started to notice the amount of analgesic going up. The market just peaked when the baby was about nine months. Something else happens at nine months. Baby goes out to kindergarten, uh, socializes, and we know that by socializing, they picked up colds, flu, whatever is the latest thing going on at that time. So everything went up. And then we knew that also there was a dynamic in the family around nine months because mothers were going back to work or might be considering going back to work and therefore there was an uncomfort in the family and also dad had had no attention in the last nine months and so he was feeling a little bit edgy as well. And then the final piece of the puzzle was that when a baby gets sick, they get sick the most at night. Basically, at night they get sick, they cry, they wake up, everybody wakes up, and nobody sleeps. So we then looked at the product itself, and we looked at the regulatory claims, and we saw in the regulatory claims that we had a claim for eight hours duration. There was an aha moment. Eight hours duration, eight hours of sleep for the baby, eight hours of sleep for the whole family. And so that was the claim that we actually made. Neurofen for children, everybody gets a good night's sleep. And what happened was amazing, because this grabbed the attention of the filter. This grabbed the, uh, the decision, make, the decision of, of the mother. And we ran this ad, which is probably the most uh, really very badly designed ad as a poster campaign in London. London market shares doubled in about three months, from 5% to 10%. We ran it nationally. Market shares nationally doubled in the next six months. We then continued to double until the brand reached around 30% market share, and then it fell away. And for the last 12 years, it has settled at 25% market share because now the new mothers are getting it recommended by their pediatrician, by their friends, by their mothers. Okay? And that's the power of great insight. I won't show you the ad. Uh, this is the 2017 relaunch from Reckitt Benkiza of Neurofem for Children. And guess what? It's the same message. So when you have a powerful message, then it lasts decades. Right, so as I said, very important that you don't just focus on the consumer, that you focus on different elements. And one of the things that we don't do very often is really look at the category from the consumer's eyes. We often think of it in terms of the way it's defined in uh, Nicholas and the team's data in DB6 or in IMS or in Euromonitor, we have these artificial boundaries of what should be in that category. But we need to step outside our industry shoes and think about how the consumer considers the category, because you and I will approach a cold in many different ways before we go off to the pharmacy and buy a product. In the UK, we might drink a lot of hot tea. We might put some lemon in it. Uh, we might take a pain relief and go to bed. There, we might suck a sweet that's not a particular sore throat or cough sweet. There are so many things that we would do before we actually uh, go and buy a product in pharmacy or get a recommendation or go to the doctor. So let's start to see the world from the eyes of real people 
not through our industry eyes. Brands and competitors. This is the other thing sometimes we do. We often look at the world from our point of view and we say, hey, the competition, boy, aren't they bad? Look at what they've done. Hey, we're so much better. Uh, so consequently, we need to sort of start to see the world from their eyes as well. The customer. Um, we've talked a lot about the pharmacist. Um, and do you know one of the most important things is that in any study that you do in terms of what would drive a purchase in the pharmacy, the pharmacist or the pharmacy assistant or sampling from the pharmacy or recommendation from the pharmacy sits in that top five or six drivers. TV advertising actually falls quite low down, but it's still very important because that might drive me to go to the pharmacy, but then I'll go and ask advice, and then I'll buy what is advised. So basically, uh, there is a little tool there called the Customer House of Strategy that can help us to understand how a customer also sees the world. Consumer and shoppers, as I said, the difference between consumers and shoppers, very in important to understand, and to basically understand their journey through the disease or through the condition. All right, start to really deeply understand what is it that they go through. And then finally, uh, when you come to have all of these great insights, this element around identifying opportunities. And I always think this is like a CSI program. You know, we're all addicted to these CSI programs. I love them. But there is a moment in the CSI program when they've gathered all of the evidence from different areas and they're standing in that room or the lab or the forensics room, as they call it, and they start to bring and piece all of the evidence together to find different hypotheses for who might have done it. And that's what we have to get better at in our organizations. Not just looking at the problem and the, and the, uh, um, the evidence from one point of view, but starting to create patterns, connect the dots, because that's the way we'll come up with something which is really different. So uh, we have something called the fresh eyes model. And as I said, what we're looking for is this win, win, win. And I would gift this to you right now. Next time you are evaluating an initiative from the team, always ask the question, what's in it for the customer? What's in it for the pharmacist or the, uh, or the, the, the brand or the trade partner that we're going to be working with? What's in it for the shopper and the consumer? And finally, what's in it for us? If that initiative does not answer all three with a yes, there, this is something important for all three, then get the team to think again. Because if not, it will fail. Right, um, once you've got these great initiatives, as I said, the challenge and one thing that we have to get so much better at is this integrated communication. Because unless we're able to use these great facilities we have with all of these great media channels, communication channels, people, then we will not be successful and we will just be wasting our money. So we have to get much better at evaluating the mix of media. We've all got very excited about digital media, but that is just a channel. And within digital media, there are so many other channels. That works together with digital media, which works together with people. Because we're lucky enough in an, to work in an industry where people are still the most important influencer of a purchase. So training is really a strategic marketing tool for your marketing teams and should be, as part of your marketing campaign, a very integral part, and you should be looking at. And that, I don't mean training for your teams. That, of course, I would uh, push, but training for your customers. Help them to be able to make better recommendations to their uh, customers. So really understanding the, the loop and where to go. And then finally, again, another piece of market research. We understand that pharmacists are the most important influencer of uh, the purchase in the store. But what is also really interesting is when you talk to pharmacists and you try to get them to explain why, what is it that influences them to give a recommendation, guess what? The top five or six things is the company, the rep, the salesman, the person who is interacting with the pharmacist. Do they understand my business? 
Do they give me the right information? Are they credible, trustworthy? Are they able to bring and grow my business? Are they able to help me give a better outcome for my patients? So hence, the training of sales and the team that interact with the customers is absolutely critical. And so there's a little tool in here which I call IOPBA, uh, which is a way to describe a selling story. All right? So start off with an issue, because similarly to a consumer, a customer needs a hook on which they can basically then give you their attention. So start off with an issue that the customer is facing. It could be something very personal within a particular store, or it could be a disease area that they have trouble finding solutions for. Then, of course, opportunity. How are you going to meet this uh, challenge? Credentials. Why should they believe you? Benefits. What's the win-win-win? And in this particular case, I would leave out the win for your brand, and I would introduce a win for the category, because your customer doesn't really care whether you're going to exchange share with your nearest competitor. What they care about is, are you going to grow my business? Are you going to bring people in who are going to buy more of this particular category? Or are you going to increase the value of the category? And then finally, what action you need them to take. Okay. These are some of the tools, and I hope, and again, all of this will be available for you to download. Uh, please take them, use them, practice them. There might be one or two in there that you really like, uh, but I would encourage you to do it because ultimately, even with the hour that we have to get today, I want you to have an ROI. I want you to be able to maybe use this and maybe create something even better in your own business. Okay? So again... Remember this Cuba, know, understand, believe, and act. Whatever you do in terms of leadership or intervention, of course, you have to tell them, but you have to then help them to understand it. And this involves more time. This involves more explanation, discussion, interaction. Okay, so we've got an opportunity to experience, and I'm going to hand over to Ed, who's going to talk about... Oh, you're going to use that, great. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Um, very quickly, how does this all then come to North America? Um, first and foremost, you're going to have some fun. Um, no alcohol, nothing <laughs> recreational that has least recently been legalized or anything like that. Um, but this will be high energy, high impact for a full day. Two, you will hand in your cell phones. It's kind of like a junior <laughs> high school dance. Um, you'll check them out uh, when you have to. Uh, three, there's also, in addition to the content that Steve went through, um, my experiences writing for Drugstore News were very instructional to me. Um, I write about the rest of the world. I'm the global commentator for them. And lo and behold, in 2017, I was the most read author in all of Drugstore News. So part of what we're going to do for the open seminars is we're going to take lessons from the rest of the world and bring them to the states in uh, bite-sized pieces, uh, which goes right to then my next point in terms of instructors. Um, we will be bringing people in. Um, so for example, and we'll talk about this in a second, for our launch um, plan for next uh, September, there'll be people flying in from Canada. There'll be people flying in from Mexico to describe real time what's happening in those markets. And then uh, finally, as you saw, and I think it's a terrific format, it's obviously working um, when you look at how many um, courses have been taught, how many countries, how many people, and the like. Um, we'll take the format and the content that we have coming in from everywhere around the world, and we will put it into the exponential framework. Um, I look forward to hearing what opportunities there are out there and doing the neurofin type opportunities mm. and putting some runs on the board here. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. Okay, so as Ed mentioned, there is uh, the opportunity to, uh, the dates are gonna be the 24th and the 25th of September. Uh, we will be not very far away from here. I think it's still, the location has still got to be firmed up. 
Um, and we will run two one-day workshops, one which will be around Winning with Consumer Healthcare 2025, um, which will really look at a deep dive on the consumer in 2025. So we've basically got psychometric analysis of the new millennial population as they then become effectively 70% of our workforce and our earning population in 2025, how they're going to think differently, how they're going to act differently, and then we'll look at what are the drivers in regulatory and in consumer and healthcare literacy. Because one of the challenges that we're facing is that, as we heard today, I think, was it nine tons of medicine on the open days coming in? Consumers in the UK, in Europe, uh, I don't know exactly for the U uh, US, 50 to 80% of these consumer populations are healthcare illiterate. They don't have, they don't know how to use the medicines, they don't know when to use the medicines, and they use too much or too little. Uh, so therefore, there is a real issue, and then that is teamed up with the challenge that we have, which is that adherence to a protocol by a doctor or a pharmacist is globally around 50%. And that actually drops to more than 80% of people who are chronically ill do not adhere to their particular protocol whether it's the pharmacological protocol or the lifestyle protocol. So there's a lot of things that we will be facing in a very few years that is really worth. So that's a very exciting one. We've run that program twice, one in uh, Europe and one in Singapore. And then there is, as um, Ed mentioned, there is uh, a really interesting day in terms of learning from the rest of the world. So we're going to have a look at the revolution in trade in many other parts of the world, what's been happening there, what could we learn from that. We'll have a look at the way that pharmacy and the pharmacy environment is changing. We'll have a look at how, the, especially in Asia, the consumer healthcare market has become borderless, which is very interesting. I wanted to ask you about you know, the challenge of branding, for example, when you are selling in Australia, but the product is actually being consumed and sold in China. Right? So how do you manage the intellectual property and how do you protect? Um, and then basically there's huge trends, and especially again from Asia and some parts in, of Europe, in terms of back to nature. So a lot of natural medicines coming in. So that should be a really, really interesting day uh, that we will have. Okay, um, that's it. I think I've got three minutes left on the clock. Thank you so much for your attention, and I hope that you've picked up some ideas, some tips and techniques, and uh, looking forward to see you again sometime in the future. Thank you so much. Great. And now I switch back to my moderator role. <laughs> um, I play one on TV. I'm not one in real life. Um, one of the things we...